All right, good morning, folks. So you've done a couple of preparatory activities about the presidency, and we're gonna start kind of getting into some details now. So today, we're gonna to talk about presidential qualifications, presidential term length, and the roles of the president. And these are the jobs, when we talk about roles, it's the jobs that we expect the president to play. I have some notes down in front of me, so you might see me looking at my notes, and that's just to make sure that I stay on course with the information that I need to provide to you. All right, so let's begin. Formal qualifications of the president. These are the constitutional qualifications. You're familiar with constitutional qualifications for when we study Congress. So you know that they come in threes. There's always an age, a citizenship, and a residency qualification. Now, in Article 2, it specifies that the president needs to be 35 years old. That's your age qualification. Now, as far as citizenship, it's not a number of years. According to the Constitution, you have to be what we call a natural born citizen, which we'll get into the details of in just a second. The residency requirement, so you have to have lived in the United States for 14 years, physically resided in the United States for 14 years. So now you think about that, it's probably because the founders felt that you had to live in the United States in order to be familiar with the issues facing the country and the interests of the citizens. It also lent itself the idea that you would have allegiance to the country if you lived in the country. Now, that might not be true in a modern world. I can basically grow up in France as a United States citizen and be very well aware of the issues and interests of the United States citizens. Okay, now let's talk more specifically about what it means to be a natural born citizen. So there are two kind of broad ways you can be considered a natural born citizen. One we consider being you solely. So in this case, when we're talking about you solely, it's the right of the soil. It means that you were born in the United States. So citizenship, natural born citizenship, you know, where, where you were physically born, born in the United States or a U.S. territory. OK, so Puerto Rico, you'd still be considered a natural born citizen. All right. That's pretty straightforward. We understand that one. It's the other category when we talk about you sanguinous, okay? That means by blood, that you are natural born citizen by blood. Now, the easy way to remember that is if your parents were citizens, then you're going to be a citizen as well. Any child your parent has will be considered a natural born citizen, regardless of where that child was born. So if your parents are living and working in France and they gave birth to you there, as long as your parents are citizens, you'd be a citizen as well of the United States, okay? Now, it's a little more complicated than that. So how do we determine natural born citizenship by blood is governed by United States law. And whenever you talk about United States law, there's always some fun peculiarities. Okay, so we have, according to United States code, there's the foundling provision. So the foundling provision works like this. Let's say I'm canoeing up in the boundary waters with my family this summer, and we land somewhere on shore to go look for some blueberries, because we always do. And while we're out in the woods looking for blueberries, we run across a small child. And it's like, hey, small child, where are your parents? What are you doing alone in the woods? And of course, the small child can't speak to me because the small child was raised by wolves. Right? So we take the small child in. Okay, now, now here's the deal. We have no idea who their parents are or where the small, ch small child's from. And if I can't prove that the small child wasn't born in the United States by the time they're 18, that child will be considered a natural born citizen and will be eligible to run for president of the United States. Pretty cool. All right, so that's your natural born citizenship. It's either, you know, by soil or by blood determines natural born citizenship. Okay, moving on to informal qualifications. So none of these are constitutional. They're just traditional qualifications that the electorate, the people that vote for president, like to see in their president. Some of these, we're breaking down some of these barriers. These informal qualifications are changing. So one is race. All but one president has been white. So we saw that barrier broken with the election of Barack Obama. And then gender. All presidents to this day have still been men. Now, Hillary Clinton made some great strides in breaking down that barrier. She was the first woman that was nominated as a major party political candidate to run for president. 
She was not the first woman to run for president, okay? Just the first woman nominated by a major political party. She also received more votes than the current office holder, Donald J. Trump. So another barrier broken. She was just unable to win the Electoral College and did not become president. Religion, all presidents have been Christian. There's two presidents where we, uh, they never really identified a specific faith. Okay, so there's Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln are those two presidents. Otherwise, all other presidents have been some form of Christian. Okay, the other qualifications here, when we look at prior experience, the electorate likes to elect people that have prior political experience, specifically executive experience. So they're more apt to elect a governor to the office of president than a senator and a representative. Now that might be changing because the world the electorate is seeing that a president might need to have more experience in foreign policy and a senator has more experience in that area than a governor does. Okay, so there might be some changing expectations around prior experience. If it's not political experience, it's often military experience. Now I could be wrong, but I think there's seven former generals that have been elected to the office of president. And that's general, so not just any type, like JFK had some military experience as well, okay, as did President George W. Bush, okay, and President Bush, but they weren't, didn't necessarily serve as generals. So the combination of the two is often a good indicator to the electorate that you would do well in the office of president. Now, again, that barrier has been broken by the current resident in the office, Donald J. Trump. He, he had no prior political or military experience, yet managed to get elected to the White House. Okay. Finally, we talk about money. You don't necessarily have, have to have your own personal wealth, but it is extremely helpful. What you do need to have is the ability to raise large amounts of money because okay? running for president costs a lot of money. So that is an informal qualification is having that ability to raise money. All right, let's talk about term length. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 4 says he shall hold his office during the term of four years. So the president is elected to a four-year term. We have a presidential election this fall, November of 2020. Uh, president Donald Trump was elected in November of 2016. It's been four years, so it's time for an election. The 22nd Amendment says no person shall be elected to the office of the presidency more than twice. Okay, so you can only be elected twice. You can only serve eight years as president. Now, the 22nd Amendment was in response to FDR. FDR had been elected to four terms as president. This photograph is from his, his fourth inaugural address. Now, during that time, if you have one person that served, you know, 12 years and is moving into like going up to year 16 as president, they're able to accumulate a lot of power. And we saw that with FDR, that there was a lot of more power accumulated in the hands of the president. See, and there was some people that wanted to push back against that. So that's not right. We can't let that accumulation of power continue. So they put the 22nd Amendment was ratified to limit the number of terms the president could serve to two. The 22nd Amendment is very handy because you add the twos together, you get four. And it reminds you of the term length, four years. And then you got two twos. Okay, so it just reminds you that you can only serve two terms. It's a good amendment. All right, moving on. So let's talk about the roles of the president. Okay, so these are the jobs we expect the president to perform. There are many, okay? What we need to understand and remember is that the president's performance is constantly being evaluated against these expectations, okay? And some presidents, most presidents will excel at some of these roles. They are truly masterful at them. It's probably why they were able to be elected president. However, at other roles, they are weak and struggle. So it all depends on, you know, what role is prominent during that president's tenure, because that is the role that the president historically is going to be judged against. Did they have to play the role of commander in chief? Did they have to play the role of protector of the people? Because the expectations of the electorate are going to align with the role that was prominent during their tenure. So let's go through these. There are two broad roles. There's the head of state, chief of state role. You can use either term. Now, in that role, all you do is exercise symbolic power. You, you're a symbol for the hopes and dreams of the people you represent. 
Okay, and what it does is it's a unifying role. It brings the people together because it reminds us what we value, what we believe as a people, those things that we hold in common. Okay, when you hear people use the phrase, we are more alike than disalike, you think head of state, chief of state. Okay, now in this role, the president will serve at, you know, important ceremonial functions, whether it's a wedding, a funeral, okay, or even, you know, maybe the, the crowning of a king in another country. Okay, if the president goes, he's representing the United States. He greets foreign visitors in this role as head of state. And then just acts, you know, as other formal symbolic acts in the name of the United States. Now, this role is kind of the opposite role is head of government. So in the head of government role, the president is elected to run the government. He's elected to influence the legislative process. And he's elected to be the head of a particular political party. He is elected to exercise actual constitutional power. And whenever the president exercises power, there are winners and losers. And because there are losers, if I make a decision as president and someone loses out because of my decision, it works contrary to the unifying role of head of state. Head of government often divides the country, okay? And whereas head of state unifies the country. So sometimes the president might need to perform a head of state role, but people will look back on the recent decisions the president has made as head of government, and they might think, well, you're being hypocritical, or they might not see, they might not believe the president to play the head of state role as much. So it's difficult that we expect the same person to play these often two contrary, contradictory roles. All right, but let's talk about the head of state in more particular. Hopefully we'll help, um, we'll give you some clues to differentiate. So if we, one way to do that is to look at a different country. So here we have the Queen of England. The Queen serves as the head of state of England. She has no constitutional power anymore, but she has large amounts of symbolic power. Now, unfortunately, the embedded video here won't play for you in the screencast. But in this video that I have loaded up here, it's her response to the coronavirus. She's speaking directly to the people of England. And there's a particular phrase in there that I want to read to you because you can clearly see that she is alluding to those values, those beliefs that make the English people English. So she says, those that come after us, will say that the Britons of this generation were as strong as any, that the attributes of self-discipline, of quiet, good-humored resolve, still characterize who we are, okay? And then she thanks the people. So she is playing that symbolic role and she plays it beautifully. When the queen speaks, the people of England listen to what she has to say. We expect the president of the United States to also play that role. So here we see a president playing that role masterfully. So this is President George W. Bush, and this is after the 9-11 attacks. He's at ground zero, and he picks up a bullhorn, and he starts speaking. And part of his goal is just to say that the country mourns, okay? That we as a country are mourning for the loss of the citizens, the citizens that lost their lives, for the emergency responders that lost their lives. And then at one point you can hear that there's someone that's listening that yells, hey, we can't hear you. And then George impromptu responds, I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knock down these buildings will soon hear from all of us. And the crowd just erupts. Because he, he was able to transition. Not only are we a nation that mourns together, but we're a nation that's going to respond. And people wanted to hear that. And there's this also, it's almost like a celebratory event that we will be able to move past this and we will be able to, you know, respond to this huge tragedy. All right, let's move on. Now the head of state role is actually subdivided into two categories. So there's the voice of the people or representative of the nation. Now when the president plays that role, he's still being head of state. But voice of the people, the president is talking to Americans. He's telling us as a group what we think, what we believe, what we value, and he's doing so to form and influence public opinion. Now, because the president is also 
the head of one of the world's largest economies and the head of one of the world's largest militaries and social and cultural powers, the president is listened to by the people of other nations. So he can use that role as well, the world leader role, to speak to the people of the world as a whole. The difference is audience. So you might have noticed that. When the president speaks to us and is talking about our values okay, and reminding us what we believe, voice of the people. When the president's speaking to the world, then it's world leader. So here we see an example of the president playing that role of world leader very successfully. So it was June 12, 1987, and Ronald Reagan traveled to West Berlin, and he gave a speech at Brandenburg Gate, and the Berlin Wall was still in existence. And he speaks directly to the president of Russia. He says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Okay, and then there was a symbolic, you know, chopping on the, the wall a little bit there. But within two years, the wall was down. Okay, very powerful moment as president playing the role of world leader. All right, now, if the Queen of England kind of reminds us what the head of state role is, that symbolic power, it's the prime minister of England that should remind us what the head of government role is. So as head of government, you are exercising real constitutional power, power given to you when you were elected to be president, okay? So like only the prime minister can do these things, only the president of the United States can do these things, head of government. Now, as head of government, there's a variety of sub roles that the president plays. So there's chief executive, there's command chief, protector of the people, chief diplomat, your textbook, I believe, refers to it as foreign policy leader. There's chief legislator, but your textbook talks about the chief agenda setter. They, they go together, they mesh together well, those two roles. And then you have chief of the party or party leader. It's the same role, just phrased differently. And chief administrator. And there's one more, there's economic planner. I like to call it manager of the prosperity. Let's go through these one at a time, but not necessarily in this order, okay? So chief executive, the president's primary power is to execute the law. So whether it's our environmental laws, it's our tax laws, he's, his, he needs to put those into action. He needs to carry out those laws. He also needs to enforce our federal laws which might mean arresting people and bringing them to court. He's the controls the Department of Justice, which is the tools by which we arrest and charge people with violations of national law. It is a broad category, the chief executive, so broad that some people will use this role in place of the head of government umbrella category. We'll just use chief executive instead. It is also finally a catch-all category. So if the president exercises a real constitutional power and we can't align that with any of the other rules we're about to talk about, we throw it into this role and we say he's playing the role of chief executive, okay? All right, commander in chief. The president commands the army, navy, air force, marines, and the coast guard to defend the United States, okay? He's the head of the military, okay? He commits troops, to you know, basically defend the United States. So here, you know, you have a picture that was taken, a photograph that was taken at 4:05 p.m. May 11, May 1st, 2011, and you see President Barack Obama and his national security team, and they're listening to live updates from Operation Neptune Spear, which resulted in the killing of Osama bin Laden. Okay. Next role, protector of the people. If there's an emergency or a natural disaster, the president has the power to protect the lives and property of the people. If he uses the military to do so, in this case, we say he's playing the role of protector of the people, not commander in chief, okay? Because he's, he's responding to like a hurricane or to a forest fire or an earthquake, some other kind of national. Uh, natural disaster. But we see this is the role that we see playing out before our eyes with the president's response to the coronavirus. He's playing the role protector of the people. Now, whereas George W. Bush was seen as being a masterful head of state, okay, and very adequate commander in chief, okay, he was see, often criticized for being a failure when it came to protector of the people. So you have an image here of the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Okay, we had a class five hurricane that hit New Orleans head on. We knew it was coming, 
yet the president was criticized for his failure to prepare a response and to respond after the fact to this natural disaster. I read to the loss of life and property in New Orleans. Chief diplomat, okay, otherwise known as foreign policy leader. The president negotiates with uh, the leaders of other countries or he has his or her representatives do so uh, when they formal negotiations, formal agreements, we call treaties, informal agreements with the leaders of other countries, we call executive agreements, you know, but this is when he's doing that, when he's talking to the leaders of, of other nations about important international matters and coming up with joint solutions, we say he's playing the role of chief diplomat, foreign policy leader. So here you see the G7 2019 meeting, and the G7 is like the seven largest Western economies. And they just make agreements about how to make sure that the world is prosperous and how we're going to conduct trade and business in a global economy. All right. Chief legislator, chief agenda setter. So this we studied a little bit. So you know that the president has a role to play in the legislative process. You're probably aware of the president's role as chief agenda setter, that as chief lawmaker, one of the requirements is that the president get up before the combined houses of Congress once a year and deliver a speech that we call the State of the Union. Well, in the State of the Union, the president lays out his legislative agenda. Here are the laws for the country that he believes we need in order to move the country forward. Okay, but he can also exercise constitutional power in this role, right? He, we know that he can veto legislation. He can reject it and say, I don't want that. And he can also signs, he signs the bills into laws. So he has a role to play as the chief lawmaker of the country. Now there's one president in particular that was truly masterful of this role, whether you call it the chief, yeah, chief legislator, chief agenda setter role, it was Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Lyndon Baines Johnson went beyond the State of the Union. He didn't stop there. It was called the Johnson Treatment because he would use his own personality. It was a very domineering personality. And he would insert himself into the legislative process. He would call senators. He would call representatives. He called them at all times of the day and night. Okay, And he would just negotiate and coerce them into what he wanted them to do and what he thought was good for the country. Okay, and he was so good at it that over 200 pieces of legislation were passed and signed into law during his presidency. Three significant pieces of legislation were the Civil Rights Act of 1964, there was the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then there was the Food Stamp Act of 1965 also, I believe. All right, so when you think about, if you ever study Lyndon Baines Johnson, if you ever get down to Austin, you go to his presidential library, they have a little mini um, Oval Office set up that has all the tools that he used to perform this particular role right there in the room. It's amazing. All right, economic planner, manager of the prosperity. So the president is expected to make sure that the economy is working well. And he's, he's expected to promote you know, uh, high employment and purchasing power of the people. So what we're talking about here is he's expected to make sure that I have money in my wallet to provide for my family's wants and needs. So with this role, it's about my money, the people's money, okay? That I can do this, I can provide for my family's wants and needs. Now, now the president in reality doesn't really have that much power to impact the economy. He's still expected to play this role. And when the economy is doing well, we unfairly give that credit to the president. But the converse is true, is also true, that when the economy is doing bad, we often unfairly blame the president. However, okay, the greatest expansion of presidential power happened under FDR in his response to the Great Depression. So whenever there is a depression or a recession, we expect the president to be another FDR and to respond to make sure that our money is preserved. OK. All right. Chief administrator. Now, whereas economic planner was about our money, the people's money, chief administrator is more about government's money. Okay, so the president sits at the top of the pyramid of executive power. He's seen as the CEO of the world's largest employer. Okay, over 4 million people work in the executive branch. 
And one of the things the president does as chief administrator is he appoints the top 4,000 people. Okay, so he puts the people at the top of a hierarchy to make sure the law is executed the way he wants it to. Okay, he can also suggest budget and the budget and money that's available to the agencies and the departments so that they can have the resources to do their job. He issues directives to all of his employees as to how he wants the law enforced or executed. We call those directives executive orders. And then finally, he gets to move things around on the pyramid. He gets to set the hierarchy so that the laws are faithfully executed. All right. So when he's playing around with government's money, when he's making sure government has the money to do their job, when he when the he's putting people in place to make sure that government can do its job, chief administrator. And here in this image here, you're probably familiar with a lot of these faces. This is the top people appointed by the president to manage the coronavirus response. Okay, so you see Dr. Fauci's on there, okay? All right, now finally, we talk about chief of the party. So the president, now this role kind of stands alongside of head of government role. There's no constitutional power that's assigned to the chief of the party. But when the president gets elected to that office, he's elevated and is considered to be the head of his or her political party as well. So President Trump is seen as being the leader of the Republican Party. You might even hear in the news, they sometimes refer to it as the party of Trump. Okay, And that's not unheard of. We did an activity. There's my Marco Rubio moment right there. We did an activity earlier in the year with political parties where you were to interview your families and then whether they were Democrat or Republican or whatever, you say, okay, so what kind of Democrat, what kind of Republican do you consider yourself to be? And they might have responded, I'm an Obama Democrat. I'm a, a Clinton Democrat. I'm a Reagan Republican. I'm a Bush Republican. I'm a Trump Republican. They align themselves with the president because the president once they're elected, they become leader of the party and they kind of shape the values and agenda of the party and even, you could say, the platform of the party in a way as well. OK. All right. All right. So to conclude, some things that you should remember from the screencast. First, formal qualifications to serve. 35 years old, natural born citizen, 14 years a resident. Term length, four year term. You can only be elected twice. That's the 22nd Amendment. You can only serve two four-year terms. Roles of the president. These are the jobs we expect the president to play. One is a symbolic role, the head of state role, okay, where they unify the country. They remind us of the values and beliefs that we share, we hold in common. Okay, two subcategories, world leader, voice of the people, the difference is audience. Then we get to head of government. Okay, this the head of government role often divides the country because the president's exercising real constitutional power. Okay, the president is evaluated and judged in all of these roles. Okay, they might be masterful at some and complete failures at the other. And it just depends on what role they needed to play during their presidency. That's how they will ultimately be judged. Later this week, you will learn about presidential powers. Now, so what you need to be able to do is align the power with the correct role. So when the president commits troops, okay, in defense of the United States, he's playing the role of commander in chief. If he commits troops in response to a hurricane and to response to another natural disaster, protector of the people. If he vetoes legislation, it's chief legislator. If he negotiates a treaty or an executive agreement, it's chief diplomat. Okay, you get the idea. All right, thank you for your time. And I'll make sure that I post this on Schoology as well. I'll post it as a PowerPoint and you should be able to access the embedded videos then. And if otherwise I'll post it as a PDF in case you don't have PowerPoint. All right, thank you.